This morning, I want to uh, look at what heaven will be like. Now, there's no way that we're going to make it all the way through this message. I have 46 slides. So, um, I'm, there's a, it's a four-point sermon. I think it will probably go the first two points this week. We'll finish up the sermon next week. Um, if I were to finish the first two points in 10 minutes, you get to go home. It's not going to happen. But um, we'll, we'll quit at the end of the second point. We're at whatever the time is. If we're early, great. You know you get out a little bonus here this morning. So um, when I was growing up way back in the Stone Age, we didn't have things like Cartoon Network. Um, there was, if you wanted to watch cartoons, you got up on Saturday morning and you went and you went and you watched the cartoons. And I remember uh, watching shows like Bugs Bunny and different things. And one of the things that I remember is that in the cartoons, uh, the one that particularly comes to mind is Bugs Bunny. When Bugs Bunny would die in the cartoons, he would start to float up toward heaven and he'd be wearing a white robe and he'd be holding a harp and uh, go up and sit on a cloud and start playing on that harp. Uh, do any of you guys remember those? A few of you? Okay. And somehow when I was younger, that equated to what I thought heaven was going to be like. And unfortunately for many Christian people, we all know that we want to go to heaven, but we just really have no idea what it is that we're expecting or what it is that we're hoping to achieve when we get there. I think what's really unfortunate is that a lot of times we want heaven because we really don't want the alternative, right? So it's not that we're excited about what heaven is going to be. It's that we are absolutely determined we don't want the alternative. And I think that's unfortunate. Now, you know, um, <coughs> desire to avoid punishment is, I'm not going to say it, is a good motivation, Right? Um, Mom and dad used it when you were growing up. I remember uh, when Bethany was real little, she's told this story several times that she was with grandpa and they went to the store and they had all of the frozen foods in the doors. And as they were walking down the aisle, Bethany kept opening up the freezer doors, right? And grandpa said, you open up one more of those and I'm going to spank you. And she stopped, <laughs> right? Because she was afraid of the punishment and it was a motivation for her but an even better motivation for us would not be to pursue heaven because we're afraid of the punishment of hell but because we want what heaven has to offer unfortunately many of us have no idea what that is and so this morning i would like to take a little time in next week as well and look at what heaven will be like so in revelation 21 if you want to turn with me I'll be reading from the New International Version. I want to read verses 1 through 7. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. <clears throat> they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and be their God. Now I want to stop there for just a minute. It says there, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. What he's talking about there, John is talking about, is not new like in brand new you know, 2024 Tesla. He's talking renewed like a perfectly, it's the same planet, it's the same heaven, it's the same earth, it's just been renewed. All of the bad stuff has been removed and has been remade. And he says there, I saw no more sea. And then he goes on and it says there that God will dwell with us 
And you see, again, repeated this theme that is kind of repeated all the way through the Bible, that I will be their God and they will be my people. He goes on to say, um, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek, Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter in the al Greek alphabet. So he's like saying here, I am the A and the Z, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So what will heaven be like? We've all seen the books about people who have claimed to have visited heaven, but what does the Bible actually have to say about heaven and why is it important? <clears throat> There's a couple of interesting things. Heaven is always referred to as up. Um, it's interesting that death or the grave is always referred to as down. I will go down into death, or I will go down into the grave, uh, down into Sheol. But heaven is always referred to as up. Do you, uh, there, the Bible Project people think that Eden, the Garden of Eden, was on a high place. And um, they kind of believe that is kind of, have you ever seen like two intersecting circles, right? And in the middle, you kind of have that kind of oblongy shape where the two circles come together. You know what I'm talking about. Um, see, I knew my notes would be good for something. Okay, so you have like these two circles and you have like this section that's in the middle. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's any truth to what they have said. But isn't it interesting that a lot that when the uh, in Genesis they went to try to build a tower to reach God. Um, I wonder if they were in search of this space. Right. Um, the, when Elijah goes to the mountain of God, he goes to the top of the mountain. When Moses goes to receive the Ten Commandments, where does he go? Up to the top of Mount Sinai. Is there any significance? Could it, could it be that there's no significance? Absolutely. But I find it interesting that all these times when people are coming to try to come into the presence of God, they're ascending up into these high places, right? We say that uh, we are three-dimensional people. When we say that we are three-dimensional people, we claim that we have height, width, and depth, right? So, when I look at a TV, is it three-dimensional or is it two-dimensional? It's two, right? It has height and width. It has the perception of depth, but it's actually, there is no depth. You're looking at a flat screen. And I've always wondered if I was a two-dimensional person, if I would actually be able to perceive that third dimension, that, that dimension of depth. 
Am I, have I totally lost you now? Because I think that heaven is probably like in a fourth dimension. Like we have three, right? That we interact with all the time. And that's why it's important that you have two eyes because with only one eye, you can't perceive depth. I think that heaven is not like this way super far distant place is actually much closer than we think. The spiritual realm is like all around us, but it's in like a fourth dimension. Um, Elisha had a servant. And Elisha, there's a, a king, I can't remember which king it was, that was trying to come against Israel. And Elisha would tell uh, the king of Israel everything that this other king was planning to do. And so the king is like, well, that guy's coming this way, fine, I'm going the other direction. And the king that was trying to come against Israel was really frustrated. And they said, well, it's because they have this prophet in Israel, and it's like he is listening in your bedroom. This is kind of Dan's paraphrase, right? And so the king is like, fine, I'm going to bump this guy off. I'm going to, you know, get rid of him. And so Elisha's servant is out there, and he's taking care of the camel or whatever he's doing, and he sees this army coming. And he runs into Elisha's house and he says, man, I told you you shouldn't have been telling the king that stuff. Now these guys are coming to take care of us, right? And Elisha says, there are more with us than there are against us. And in my mind's eye, I picture, you know, Gehazi, the servant, looking out the door and seeing nothing but the army and like, have you been drinking what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and so Elisha prays, and his eyes are opened, and he sees the army of the Lord. Now, did they just magically come there instantly? No, they were, they were there. It's just that Gehazi's eyes were not open to them. He could not see them. And I think that's the way it is with us as well, that the spiritual realm is all around us, but that normally we cannot see it. Kind of like that fourth dimension that I'm talking about. Why would God do that? Well, I think, first of all, if we could actually see what was happening in the spiritual realm, we'd probably be so scared we wouldn't be able to function. So, you know, it talks about heaven. It talks about heaven always being up. But I don't think it's like this way super far distant place that we oftentimes associate it with. There are four things that I think that we can learn about heaven from Scripture. And the first is this. What is heaven? What is heaven? Well, first of all, it's a place. It does actually exist. It's not just a state of mind. It's an actual place. In John 14, 2, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's a place. It exists. It's not just a, a state of mind or an idea that's out there. And heaven is where God is. Heaven is where God is. It's not just a zip code. How many of you have a home? Everybody should be raising your hand, right? Right? Do we all have the same home? No, we do not. But the place where you hang your hat is the place that you call home. 
right? It's different for each of us, but it is that place where you can be yourself, where you feel comfortable, where you can kick off your shoes, sit down in your chair, and you don't have to worry about what other people think, right? Heaven is not just a zip code. What makes heaven heaven is the fact that God is there. It's where God is. That's what makes heaven heaven. If it wasn't if for God being there, it would just be another place. And so heaven is heaven because it is where God is. Now here's something that's interesting that you might not have considered. Heaven has also, just like earth, been affected by sin. The Bible says that all of creation has been subject, subjected to futility or frustration <clears throat> because of sin. Do you remember in the garden that God gave Adam and Eve dominion over creation? He placed them over all of creation and told them to take care of it. And then they promptly went and they ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is my, this preacher's opinion, that when they sinned in the garden, that they turned that dominion that God gave them over to Satan. They surrendered that dominion to Satan. And you go through scripture and you'll read over and over where Satan is referred to as the prince of this earth or the, the prince of the air. Um, I believe it's because when, when they sinned, they turned that dominion over to Satan. And because God did not want Satan to have this perfect world that he created, all of creation was subjected to futility. Do you remember there were curses? God cursed the earth, the land, and that it would bear weeds. Um, it's interesting that we work so hard to grow the crops that we want in our garden, but the weeds grow without any effort at all, right? Um, all of creation was subjected to futility, it was subjected to frustration because of Adam and Eve's sin. And heaven itself was affected by sin. <clears throat> in fact, in Revelation 12, 7 through 12, it tells us that there is even a war that has taken place in heaven. And I don't have this in the scriptures on the slides this morning, but let me read that for you just really quickly. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12, where it says this. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. So what we have is not only the physical creation that we see here on earth that has been affected by sin, but heaven as well. So what is heaven like today? And that's the second point I want to bring out. What is heaven like today? Well, we can see in Luke that it is a place of rest. So, and, and I know that I know that I'm straining the, the, the straw here just a little bit, because when Jesus is talking, uses this, this illustration, he's actually talking about paradise, right? 
have people, I want to be careful here because I want you to, to be confused. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, whose sins did he die for? Everybody's, right? He died for all sins, past, present, and future. So he died for the sins of the people who were around the cross on that day that he was crucified. He died for your sins and my sins, even though we were born 2,000 years approximately later. He also died for the sins of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of those guys that we read about in the Old Testament. That creates a problem. What do we do with those people who are righteous, who have done what God asked them to do, but are still not forgiven? Because all of these guys in the Old Testament that were righteous, Elijah, Elisha, uh, all of these guys, David, were righteous people. They did what God asked them to do, but they weren't forgiven because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. What do we do with those people? Well, here we go. There's a place called paradise. Remember, Jesus is on the cross, and um, the thief turns to Jesus and says to him, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, I tell you, this day you will be with me in where? Par he didn't say heaven. He said paradise. Jesus uses, the, tells this story about the rich man and Lazarus. And I believe that he's actually talking about paradise. He says here this, Luke 16, 19 through 31, it says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And his, at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores, those of Lazarus. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, he, there he, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am agony in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. <clears throat> and besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father... <laughs> Send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, then they will repent. He said to them, If they do not, do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, what I want you to understand here is that Jesus nowhere says that this is a parable. <clears throat> and I think that he is probably referring to an actual place. In this place, we see two compartments. We see a compartment where there is comfort and rest. And we see a, a compartment where there is torment. I am of the opinion, and this is not of thus saith the Lord, but I am of the opinion that when Jesus was ascended, remember Jesus is raised from the dead on the third day, on Sunday morning. And Mary Magdalene sees him in the garden, 
And he says to her, do you remember what he says to her? Don't touch me for I've not yet ascended to the Father. He's been dead for the part, better part of three days, but he's not been to heaven. Where has he been? Well, I think he told us on the cross. He went to paradise. And he made a proclamation. And I think the proclamation was something along these lines. It's all set and done. Your destiny is set. <clears throat> Could God really hold us accountable for our sins if Jesus, who was God, was unable to do what he asked us to do? So until Jesus' death and his resurrection... Everything was kind of in limbo. But when Jesus died and was resurrected, now the forgiveness of sins has been provided for all of those people who have died before Christ. And when he ascends to the Father, remember it's in the at the very in the what is it, the very beginning of Acts or the very end of Matthew, where he is speaking and he ascends to heaven. Right Again, going up. <clears throat> I think at that time, he took that compartment of paradise with him to heaven. Why do I say that? Because later in the gospel, or later in the New Testament, we'll find people in heaven. Um, <clears throat> in Revelation 6, 9, it mentions the saints that are under the sea of glass, or uh, saints under the altar. And that doesn't mean that the altar is smashing down on them it's it think of like missouri being underneath iowa so it's it's more of a geographic type description so the saints are below the altar geographically not like the altar is on top of them right <clears throat> okay so it mentions the saints under the altar uh, revelation 15 2 talks about the saints on the sea of glass and next week I'll have some pictures to hopefully make that a little more clear to you. And then uh, thirdly, Stephen sees Jesus stand to welcome him to heaven. Now, why, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because every time that we find Jesus mentioned in the New Testament, after he has ascended, he is always seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Why is that significant? Because it shows that his work is done. His work of redeeming mankind is finished. When you've been working hard all day and the work is finally over, what do you do? You go in and you sit down in the recliner, right? Get yourself a big glass of tea or whatever it is that you're drinking and you, you finally sit down and you relax. When scripture refers to Jesus being seated at the right hand of the throne of God, it shows that his work of redeeming mankind is done. He's finished his job. He finally gets to sit down and relax, right? But when we come to this reference in uh, Acts regarding Stephen, we see something peculiar. We see Jesus not seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We see him standing at the right hand of the throne of God. Let me read that real quick. Acts 7, verses 55 through 60, where it says this. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he looked up to heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at God's right side. He said, look, I see heaven open, and I see the Son of Man standing at God's right side. Then the religious leaders shouted loudly, they covered their ears, and they all ran to Stephen. They took him out of the city and began to throw stones at him to kill him. And those who told lies against Stephen lift, left their coats with a young man named Saul. While they were throwing stones, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell on his knees and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. After Stephen said this, he died. So why is Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne of God? I believe he's standing to welcome Stephen home. It's the only time we see him standing. And I believe that the reason is, is that Jesus is standing to welcome Jesus home. 
Um, I believe that those who have gone on before can also observe us. Now, um, when I was at camp this last week, somebody asked my father-in-law that, and, and Larry said no. But I kind of tend to disagree with him, and here's the reason why. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, it says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. When I was in college, my professor always said, uh, Reese said, when you come to a therefore, you need to ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? It relates back to something immediately preceding it. Hebrews 11 is referred to as the faith chapter, and it goes through example after example after example of men and women who by their faith accomplish these great things. And so if you're actually looking at that, let me just back up here and read just the very end of Hebrews chapter 11. It says this. I'm in Revelation. It says this. Um, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all of these, having gained approval from, through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. If you, take, if you don't split the two chapters together, then who are the witnesses? Well, it's all these people in Hebrews chapter 11. The Apostle Paul is saying... Since we have all of these faithful people who have passed on, who are there witnessing us and cheering us on, let us run this race that God has set before us. If that's true, then the people that we love and they care about are actually watching us as we run our race for Jesus and they're cheering us on. And then finally, there's also worship that's taking place in heaven. In Revelation 4, 8 through 11, it says this. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and, uh, and was covered with their eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they would never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being there's worship that is happening in heaven doesn't it make sense that we figure out what we are supposed to be doing now so that when we get there we don't look silly have you ever got yourself into a situation where you found yourself in a place where you had no idea what was going on or what you're supposed to be doing? Yeah, it's not fun, is it? 
you know, why, if we're going to be worshiping the creator of everything that is, why would we not want to get started now? That's what heaven is like today. Next week, we're going to look at like heaven, what heaven will be like when Jesus comes again. And some practical things that we need to do to make sure that we're ready. So, if you liked what you got today, come back next week. We'll get the rest of it. If nobody comes back next week, I know that you didn't like what you got today. And I need to do something entirely different.